Well, I'm glad you're here. I appreciate you being in church uh, tonight, and we're going to have a great time. Let's pray together, and then after we pray, uh, we'll be seated and have a song. Father, we ask tonight that you would bless. We thank you uh, for the church. We thank you for the, uh, the mission of the church. We uh, rejoice in what took place today as we sent these Bibles uh, back to Ohio to, to go to the uttermost parts of the earth. And Lord, thank you for our people and their vision and their sacrifice and their involvement in this project. And we ask you to bless. Be with the gills as even now they travel. I pray you keep them safe. Uh, Lord, help us tonight to, to, to be challenged by your word. Bless the music. Be at the song service. And we'll praise you and thank you for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Still the blood that saves from sin It's still the blood that cleanses within From the highest star in heaven To the depths of the sea It is still the blood of Jesus that brings victory to me on the words that they do and some men count on the times they pray through but when the battle's over and the victory's been won I'll go home through the blood of the Father's only Son Still the blood that saves from sin is still the blood that cleanses within from the highest star in heaven to the depths of the sea. It is still the blood of Jesus. Yes, it's still the blood of Jesus. Oh, it's still
right, good. We're glad to have guests with us tonight. Always happy to have guests. If you would be so kind to register, take a connection card out of the back of that pew in front of you and fill it out and drop it in the offering plate. Give us your mailing address. We'll send you a gift card. Or at the end of the service, take the gift or go take it back to the hospitality desk and they will give you a gift bag. It's got a book in there and some uh, information on the church. It'd be worth your time to do that. I encourage you about that. But uh, in any case, we are glad that you're here. I took my order of service. What song are we singing? 159. If you need a book, 159. Let's all stand. We're going to sing some, then we're going to shake some hands. I want you to shake somebody's hand tonight that you haven't spoken to since you got here. Come on now. All righty. We're going to sing first. Brother Steve, you lead us. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's sing it together. All praise the fellowship hall and uh it's in the kitchen uh you know what you come to fall festivals we do not um uh, we do not personally we do not celebrate halloween uh, if if the fall festival is offensive to you it, it'll be over after october um uh, and, and really you know you, you don't have to participate there's no need in getting all upset about it uh we steer clear of witches and goblins and and uh, things like that, <clears throat> but uh, it's just a fun night for the kids and uh, a safe environment for them just to have a good time, and that's really what it's all about, uh, so uh, we would appreciate your help with that. Uh, also, tonight after the service, the church family is invited to celebrate uh, Emma Paris's 18th birthday in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, no gifts are necessary. Just come by and enjoy a cupcake and wish her a happy birthday. And we'll try to remind you about that at the end of the service as well. Uh, there's a mistake in the bulletin today. Uh, the dinner on Wednesday night, uh, those who will help with desserts and serve are not uh, the A Sunday school. Um, let's see. Junior, it's not junior A and ESL. Those who help with the dinner Wednesday night are Road to Freedom, uh, Grace Point and Junior B. And so uh, those in our class, uh, if you would let Miss Jessica know if you can help out and then the others, if you could help out, that would be great. Uh, so it is not A. Keep that in mind if you would. And uh, let's see. Let's do this. Um, what do you guys have? Cards? Okay, you have the longevity sheets? Do you have the longevity sheets? Okay, if, uh, if you have been serving in a ministry here for 10 years or more and you still are serving, uh, we want to find out about that. We, I think we've covered most everybody, but in case we have missed anyone, uh, we have a little sheet, a little form. We're going to recognize some folks next Sunday uh, who've been doing so. And uh, if, you, uh, if you would be so kind as to fill out one of these forms, that would be most helpful uh, but you can't fill one out if you don't have one and so uh, if you don't have one if you'll raise your hand they'll give you one you've been serving in one of these areas and there are other areas of service I understand that uh, but uh, if you've been serving in one of these areas if you've been serving in an area it's not on there you want to put it on there that's fine write it on there uh, anybody need a sheet anybody need a sheet be sure to get them fill it out drop in the offering plate in just a moment 
Uh, while they're doing that, let's go ahead and show the video. I know some, many of you saw it this morning. Some of you were not privileged to be able to see it. This is a recap of what happened here Friday and Saturday as we, dis, we assembled and uh, prepared 50,000 scriptures to go to the mission field. We'll take a few moments and watch this.
All right, there we go. My bad. I told Brother Steve that's the fastest I've ever seen him move. Um, but uh, thank you for what you did, and uh, you pray. Pray God would bless those scriptures and use them. I appreciate uh, Brother Caleb did that video. Uh, Brother Luke does a lot of the videos. Brother Kevin Mickle does a lot of the videos, uh, and I'm probably leaving somebody out. But uh, they, these things take a lot of time. And I appreciate these men and their willingness to serve in this way. Uh, I overheard him talking to someone else today. That, that was probably a five- or six-hour project uh, there. And so when you see these graphics and videos and scriptures and stuff up here, that stuff doesn't just happen. I appreciate the hard work that makes that possible. Real quick, I want to spend a couple minutes talking to you about the fall program. Uh, we're starting next Sunday. Our theme, I'll tell you how we arrived at this, our theme is Striving Together. We had, our missions conference was already scheduled, and uh, I had asked Pastor Chapel about the possibility of him coming and preaching for us and, at some point, and um, uh, they called several months ago and asked if we would be, well, they do these regional conferences, they call them striving together conferences, and so uh, we agreed to do that, we kind of rearranged our missions conference uh, to make it all happen. I'm really excited about it, the missionaries are pumped about it, being able to be here for those two days and just be here and uh, benefit. <clears throat> uh, but we decided to, to make our theme for the, and I'm going to preach tonight a message entitled Striving Together. Uh, we decided to make our theme for our fall program, Striving Together. And so uh, next Sunday, uh, October 1st, Striving Together with Longevity. Uh, we're going to be recognizing those who have been serving 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35 years in ministries here. Uh, and we're also going to have a special time for all of our adults, 60 and over, It'll be in the activity center. There'll be a continental breakfast there. I'll be down there. My wife will be down there. And uh, we're just going to have a good time of fellowship. The young people are going to be down there serving. And uh, we have a gift for everyone. 60. It's a nice gift, too. It's a nice gift. 60 years of age and over. And I think you'll enjoy it. Um, and so I, I, I encourage you about that. Uh, I, we, we've got to have... For a program to be effective at all, we have to have, you have to get the word out, okay? And so we have, uh, we have the big card. This has all the Sundays. This would be great if you're canvassing, you're going out, going door to door. Uh, you want to, something to put on people's doors. I find it really helps uh, when you're knocking on doors like that to, for them to think you have a reason for being there. You know what I'm saying? When you say, hey, we're just out. Could I give you this? And it just, it, it validates your being on their front porch. And so uh, we ordered how many of these? We have 5,000 of these. And we have 5,000 of the same card in a pocket form. Okay? And so we want to get them out. Uh, there's some back there in the lobby. We, uh, we also uh, ordered a bunch of cards that are pocket size that have a little more detail maybe on them than the big card and uh, this first card and the ushers have some of this this is the striving together with longevity this is for next sunday 
Okay, in a perfect world, we would have had these last week, uh, but we have them now for the entire program. And uh, I'm going to ask the ushers to come and just bring some of these. Some of you know someone who is in this, they're 60 and over, they're unchurched, they're unsaved. Uh, we're going to have a free breakfast for them. We're going to have a gift for them. And I'm going to ask the ushers just to pass some of these cards through. And I want you to think of someone. Here's what happens when you say, let's bring people to church. Everybody thinks, I don't know anybody. I don't know anybody. But if you're able to put somebody's, okay, someone 60 or over. Uh, so they're going to come through. Take some of these, but don't take them if you're going to waste them. Take them if you'll take them and hand them to someone this week and say, hey, our church is having a special day next Sunday for senior adults. We would love to have you come. It's going to be a free breakfast with our pastor and his wife. Uh, please take these and utilize them. After they get those done, they're going to come back and they're going to have some of the uh, millennial cards, and we're going to pass some of those out as well. Um, here's what you want to do. Over the next six weeks, you bring an adult visitor who's never been in our church before. They've never visited our church before. That is what a visitor is for this fall program, all right? Be sure that they register. Be sure they put your name down as being the person who invited them. We're going to take all those brand new adult visitors, and we're going to take those who invited them. We're going to put them in two separate drawings. And at the end of the program, we're going to give away two $250 gift cards. Uh, we'll draw names out. However many visitors you have, that's how many times your name goes in the drawing. And uh, your visitors, they get their name in the drawing as well. And so uh, I want you to work at it. Try to think of somebody you can get to come. And uh, let me tell you one thing that I'm seeing. We, we have a couple. I thought they would be here today, uh, and they're planning to join our church, uh, Sam and Jean. But uh, let me tell you what's happening. Some of these people, uh, they are growing very weary with the contemporary church movement extremely weary and um, I don't that's not an indictment I'm just telling you that's what they're telling me they're just saying you know what we still like to hear the hymns by the way I do too and I'm not against modern songs if they're done right and the doctrines right I'm not against those but I don't ever want us to 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 depart from the hymns and they said we still like traditional worship I do too I just like going to church where it's more like church than a rock concert that's just me. That's just me. I, I just think that, that there, there needs to be something different. That's, I'm not preaching on that tonight. Uh, but uh, but I'm, I'm going to tell you what's happening to a lot of these people. They are literally being pushed aside. And some churches have even said things like this. Well, when these old people die off, we can do whatever we want to. That's firsthand. I'm telling you. I know what I'm talking about. And so... Uh, you know what? I want folks to know that, that uh, yeah, we have screens and we do media and we have things and we, have, we use a new song now and then, but we are a traditional Baptist church. And there's still a place that does church like church has been done. And, and I'm not ashamed of that, not embarrassed about that. I'm thankful for that. Uh, but these people need to know. And you know what they tell me? This couple, man, we didn't know. We didn't know you guys. We didn't know you guys were here. And... Uh, so, so help us get the word out. The second Sunday is Millennial Sunday. Uh, this is, uh, if they're out of high school, 18, 19-year-olds through 35-year-olds, uh, on October the 8th, instead of a breakfast, we're going to do a luncheon for them. We're actually, it's going to help us if we can sign these people up. If you get a visitor, if you'll sign them up so that we can plan for food. Uh, but that day, we're going we're gonna, to... Uh, kind of cater to that that uh area of uh of our church that that area of society uh, i told the teachers a while ago uh, there's a lot of talk about millennials what's happening and how uh, a lot of millennials are leaving the church that bothers me but i want to tell you what else bothers me it's just the whole mindset of millennials it's not just religion just how they think uh stuart mason told me last week he said uh, he said, if, if uh, the people in my town had had their way, uh, Bernie Sanders would be their president. And he's, an, uh, he's, he's not ashamed. He's a socialist. Uh, and and I, you know what? We have failed a generation uh, and, and just have not done a very good job teaching and training. And so... Uh, 
young couples, 20s, 30s, college-age kids, uh, uh, the, the, the young adults in our GAP class, uh, the NSYNC class, uh, the, the, uh, uh, what's the Crossroads class. Those, those are the people that uh, we just want to have a fellowship time, have a lunch, and chat with them and try to be an encouragement to them. Everybody here knows someone in that age group that does not go to church. Everybody does. The usher's going to come. We're going to pass some of these cards out. I want you to take some of these. And uh, over the next 10 days, uh, let's see, no, 13 days, get these out. Get people to come. If you get someone, si- if you get someone say, that'll say, hey, we'll come. We'll feed them well. Uh, if you get someone to say they'll come, turn that into the office so that we can kind of plan. We're going to have a sign-up sheet Wednesday night for our church folks in this age group. And uh, then back in the back, uh, we're not going to pass them out tonight, but there are family cards and uh, hometown hero cards. I'm really excited about the hometown heroes. And uh, law enforcement, firefighters, emergency personnel, doctors, nurses, and school teachers. And there are others, I know, but these are the ones that we want to recognize that day. We're going to have a gift for them. We're going to have a breakfast for them. And uh, I've already contacted Sheriff Andrews, and he's going to do everything he can to, to, to uh, encourage his people about being here. Uh, we'll be in touch this week with the police chief, the police department, and the fire stations. And uh, we wanna, we're going we're gonna to get some gift baskets to some of the nurses' stations at the different hospitals in our community, uh, put some snacks and stuff in there along with some of these cards. But you know someone who's a nurse, a firefighter, a, sheriff, a deputy, a police officer, uh, help us with this. Uh, invite your doctor. If you've got a doctor's appointment in the next day, invite your doctor. Take one of these cards and ask him to come. Uh, you say, oh, they'd never come. Uh, well, they won't if you don't ask. I promise you they won't if you don't. I'm going to invite my doctor. And uh, so you, you, uh, you help us with this. Those cards are in the back for all the various Sundays. We don't have cards for every single week. Uh, one week we are... Um, you're going to be emphasizing our young people, uh, striving together for youth on the 29th, and then striving together for the world, the missions conference. I'm pretty excited about that. There's some great things happening. I'm glad just to be able to be a small part of it. Thank you for what you did for the missionary Christmas offering today. Uh, if you have not yet given, you can still do that. If you, did, if you were not able to give at all today, uh, you can give over the next couple of weeks. We just need to get as much in as we can so we know what we have to work with in uh, providing Christmas for these five families uh, that are going to be joining us. Let me tell you, it's going to be a very hectic time. It's going to be a very busy time. And, uh, but it's going to be a, 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 a wonderfully enjoyable time uh, as we minister to others. And, it's, and then we have, I have pastors calling me saying, hey, we're coming to the Striving Together conference. I uh, heard from a pastor in Charlotte this week who said, I'm planning to come. Uh, uh, had a pastor in Maryland recently tell me, man, I'm going to try my best to come. And so uh, we're, we're going to have a great time. The ushers are coming. I think that's all the stuff I need to cover. And I won't uh, infringe upon your time tonight. I'm aware of what, where we're at on the clock. So uh, don't worry about that. All right, let's pray. And the ushers will help us tonight with the offering. Father, we ask your blessing tonight on our offering. We thank you for the sacrifice of our people. Uh, Lord, continue to meet our needs as we try to evangelize our community and, yes, even the world through our missions program. Uh, Lord, God and direct, we pray. Bless the work that's going on here in the auditorium this week. Help them to make a lot of headway on this project. And uh, thank you for the new carpet back in the the nursery and uh, other things that we're just day by day trying to uh, get some things taken care of. Just meet our needs, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you. All right, Brother Ray is going to come pray for us. Uh, remember Miss Abel, Brother Fowler. Uh, remember Jake's mom, Mrs. Mooneyham, who's battling cancer. And I know there are others as well. We have a lot of needs. Uh, continue to pray for uh, Tony Mason, uh, Stuart Mason's, uh, Tony's mother, Stuart's mother-in-law, uh, who was just recently diagnosed with cancer and did not get a good report, not what they were hoping for this week. Uh, it's going to have to have some surgery, I think. And so, um, and I know there are many, many others, a lot, a lot of people hurting. And so we'll have prayer, and then we're going to go to Philippians chapter 1 tonight. If you want to go ahead and turn there in your Bibles, we'll have prayer, a special, and then we'll come back with the message. Father, we, we thank you for your goodness, and, and Lord, we're, we're just filled with the joy as uh, um, Brother Gill talked about this morning in Sunday school, that thank you, Lord, that you, you will always be with us, and, and Lord, we, we were sure of that, and Father, we thank of these people that, as Preacher mentioned, that in the name of Christ, as we lift up their names tonight, for Brother Fowler, Miss Sable, for Mrs. Mooningham, and also for Pastor Mason's uh, mother-in-law, who's uh, struggling with her health, and and, and dear Lord, I, I pray as God's people that we would pray and that we would encourage one another in love and good works. Be with our dear preacher tonight, that Lord, you would use him and speak to our hearts, dear Lord, through uh, your word that does not return void. And I pray that, Lord, that you would just speak to every believer in here. And as we um, embark on uh, working together to try to be a blessing to our community and people uh, of longevity and also for uh, young people, and I pray that, Lord, that we would... Uh, really strive to work hard and to get people into the church house to be under the, the sound of the gospel and and Lord despite what our world's going through and uh, Lord I, I thank you Heavenly Father for the men and women in our country who serve in our armed forces and I thank you Heavenly Father for uh, men and women of, of valor and bravery of just people that that Lord that give of their own freedom to protect ours and despite uh, what we believe and what our opinions are. Lord, help us to never forget those who have served and who are serving. And I pray, that Heavenly Father, that you would use us, uh, the message tonight, that we would uh, do, do good as Jesus did. And uh, Lord, help us to uh, be about the business of just spreading the gospel in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>
Philippians chapter 1, Paul is writing to the believers at Philippi, and he said to them in verse 8 that he longed to see them. In verses 12 through 18, we don't take time tonight to read all the verses, but he comforts them concerning his trials, and he said this is all, this is all for a reason. And then in verses 23 through 26, he, uh, he begins to speak about his impending death, and he comes to the final words of the chapter, and he speaks of them, of striving together. That is the theme uh, this fall of our fall campaign, striving together. What does that mean? What is Paul talking about when he says in verse number 27, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent. I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of of the gospel. Father, bless the reading of your word. And as we look into this passage and uh, try to glean truth that would help us, I pray you would open our eyes and enlighten us. May your Holy Spirit have free course tonight in our service. Uh, I pray that nothing would be said that would uh, dishonor you. And I pray that nothing would be left out that you would say if you were here. Thank you for these dear people and their faithfulness to church on a Sunday night when so many Christians have abandoned this aspect of their Christianity. So many churches have closed their doors and dimmed their light for Sunday night. There's no service. God, I thank you that we have this great crowd who still sees the importance of being in the house of God on Sunday evening. I pray you bless them for it. Be with those who listen tonight by way of live stream. Speak to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What does it mean when Paul wrote to the church at Philippi and he said, I hope that... Uh, I hope that it will be found that you are striving together for the faith of the gospel. I want you to notice from just these few verses, three or four things, and we'll be just a, just we'll get you out of here by seven o'clock, I believe, uh, just about a half an hour. But look with me if you would at verse number twenty-seven. Here, here Paul begins, and he says, "Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ." If we're going to strive together. And by, that's, that's, what, that's what a church is all about. It's us working together, striving together. By the way, we are striving together with other churches who preach the gospel. They may not all do it just like we do it, and they have, may, may have a different worship style than what we might feel the Lord would have for us. But I'm not against them if they are trying to get the gospel out. I want to strive with them uh, and, and trying to do that here in this community and around the world. But the first thing that I wrote down in my notes here tonight is this. If we're going to strive together, we need, need to live a life that is worthy. A life that is worthy. He said there in verse number 27, only let your conversation. The word conversation there does not mean what you say. It means what you do. That's what your conversation is. It is your manner of life. It is how you behave. I want you to notice here in this verse that Paul, on purpose, as he is inspired by the Spirit of God, said, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. And that word only, it means alone. L listen to me tonight. Everybody, everybody listen to me. We, we live very complex lives. Life, life has changed, all right? We're not living our grandparents' lives. Uh, uh, our culture has changed. Society has changed. People, be it good or bad, have never been more busy than they are in 2017. There is a million things that are going on in your life and in my life. 
We have jobs to work. We have families to nurture. We have marriages to build and to maintain. Uh, we have kids to raise. We have ministries to operate. We have uh, hobbies to enjoy. There are a million things that are going on, and we have a lot on our plate. You have a lot on your plate tonight. And I, I mean, I'm sincere when I say that. You have a ton going on. But here's what Paul said. Uh, God said through Paul, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. The thing about which you should be most concerned tonight is that your life is that it is a good representation of the gospel of Christ. Now listen, I'm talking about more important than how much money you make, more important than what you shot when you played golf yesterday, more important than how big that fish was that you caught yesterday. I'm not against any of those things. Paul said, only, alone, the most important thing is to be sure that you're living a life that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. That's the most important thing. Now, somehow, we have managed to push that way down on our list of priorities. Now, we have uh, uh, bred a culture that folks come to church if they, if they don't have anything else to do. Something is wrong with this picture. Something is wrong. Or we come to church on Sunday and then we live like the devil Monday through Saturday. That is not right. That is not a life that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now I want you to notice something from this verse. Look if you would at what he said here. He said, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That word becometh or the word becoming, that's not a word that we use much anymore. If uh, you, you may... You may you may have grown up in a different era when that word was used more often, but the word becoming means it's flattering or attractive or lovely or handsome. You might say to someone, uh, that is a very becoming dress. Paraphrase, that looks good on you. That looks good on you. Now, how many of you ladies, uh, uh, you look at a dress in a catalog or you look at a dress hanging on the rack and uh, you, uh, you take... Yeah, I, I've gone shopping enough to know, ladies. I know, I know the deal, okay? I know how it works. And you get three or four or five or six or 27 dresses, and uh, you take them all to the, to the uh, changing room, to the uh, dressing room there, the fitting, and you try them all on. And it, it looked good on the rack. Right? How many of you ladies can say amen? You know what I'm talking about. It looked it look good on the rack. Man, it looked good in the catalog. Look really good, but it don't look good on me. It just doesn't. I, my wife has said this to me: it doesn't do anything for me. Right? Same thing is true. Uh, usually, men don't. Usually, men are more prone uh, to go uh, pick out one suit, try it on, buy it, and come to the house. That's the way it rolls with the men, right? Uh, but see, men don't understand shopping is an experience. I'm trying to get on you ladies' good side tonight. I don't think I'm being very successful. Uh, but uh, but, but it's, you, you say, well, it's just not, it's not becoming. I want to challenge us tonight that as members of Fellowship Baptist Church that we strive together to live a life that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. Listen to me. If the gospel doesn't look good on you, it's not the fault of the gospel. It's your fault. The God, that's what that is saying. The gospel ought to look good on us. It ought to be a life becoming of the gospel of Christ. What is the gospel? The gospel is the death, the burial, the resurrection of the only begotten Son of God. Almighty God saw the needs of sinful man and sent his holy lamb down to the earth to be slain. That, in a nutshell, is the gospel. And we have received the gospel. We have put our faith in the gospel. We have trusted the gospel. And our job, as we strive together, is to make the gospel look good. To live a life that is worthy. I want you to imagine with me that you have a child, and, uh, and many of you do. I want you to imagine with me that 
On the other side of the country somewhere, and you don't even know this at the time, but on the other side of the country, there is another child, and that child is on a transplant list. Maybe that child needs a new heart, or maybe that child needs lungs, or maybe that child needs a kidney, but he's on a transplant list. Now, those, those parents on the other side of the country, they are praying. If I can say this without being cruel, they're praying for someone to die. And I've read stories about parents who have children who are in need of a transplant and the turmoil that they deal with as they pray and ask God to provide a heart for their child, that the only way that child's going to live is they get a heart. And they know that when they pray that it means someone else is going to die. And what you don't know, and don't take this wrongly, but your child is going to be the answer to their prayers. Maybe there's a, an accident, something happens, and you, you have to bury a little child or a little baby. And then let's suppose, and they do this sometimes, that years down the road, they, they reunite the family of the donor with the family of the recipient. Let's suppose that you had to lose a little child who was five years old and they took that, your child's heart and they shipped it to the other side of the country and they put it in the chest of a little baby. And now let's suppose that 10 years have passed and it's, that child is now a teenager, he's 15, and they, they create this reunion. Suppose that child comes in and it's very obvious that that child is wasting his life. Suppose that child comes in and he's unkept and you find out through some research that he's struggling with an addiction, that he has been foolish with how he has lived. He's made some horrible choices. If you're anything like me, you know what you're thinking? Let me tell you something. My child died so that you could live. How dare you? How dare you waste the life that my child's death brought to you? And I wonder how often God Almighty must look down from heaven and say, My son had to die so that you could live. We ought to live a life that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Together. We ought to strive together to do that. Paul says not only... Should we strive together to live a life that is worthy? But I want you to look at verse 27 again, the middle part of the verse, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit. That phrase, stand fast, means to stand firm. It means to persevere. Number one, if we're going to strive together, we need to live a life that is worthy. Number two, if we're going to strive together, we need to have an endurance that is unusual. You know what that means? Here's what it means. It means that we're going to stay in this thing. We're going to keep on living for Jesus Christ. We're going to keep on serving God. We're going to stay in church. We're going to stay engaged in ministry. We are going to live a life. We're going to exhibit an endurance that is unusual. Let me tell you, we live in a culture of quitters. We have raised a bunch of kids who don't know how to carry on unless everything is going their way. Right. And that's why you as a parent ought to, man, you ought to teach and train and pray. And you ought, by the way, you ought to exhibit that kind of tenacity and that kind of endurance. I would hate for my kids to grow up and know their daddy as a quitter. It got rough, so I quit. It wasn't easy, so I quit. I didn't enjoy it, so I quit. It wasn't what I thought it would be, so I gave it up. I threw in the towel. Paul said no to this church at Philippi. He's writing to them, and he said, I want to challenge you that you stand fast in one spirit. He wants them to stand true and to stick with it and persevere. Charles Spurgeon said, conversion is turning into the right road. The next thing is to walk in it. The daily going on in that road is as essential as the first starting if you would reach the desired end. That's powerful. Spurgeon said, 
Getting saved is like turning into a right road, but the next thing is to walk in it. And if you're going to get where God intended for you to go with your salvation, you're going to have to stick with it. You're going to have to keep it. He goes on and says, to strike the first blow is not all the battle. To him that overcometh, the crown is promised. To start the race is nothing. Many have done that who have failed. But to hold out until you reach the winning post is the great point of the matter. The church today, our church today, is in need of members who will persevere. He'll just stay with it. That's why next week we want to take these people who have stuck with it for 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years. And we want to, in a very small way, just say, thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for your tenacity. Thank you for your endurance. Thank you for your perseverance. Christianity was not established and has not been preserved by people who were quitters. It just hasn't. It just hasn't. Our Savior modeled endurance for us when he was here on the earth. The Bible said he set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane just before his crucifixion, and he begged God to deliver him. But he said, God, if you don't choose to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish. And you know what? When he finished, that's what he said when he was on the cross. He said, it is finished. I finished. I finished. I remember I remember, I, I, was just, I was just taught, you just don't quit. You just don't quit. And I remember, I, I, I've told the story about when I first got in the bus ministry, we used to have a, our buses parked out here and there was a gas pump. The church had a gas pump. And, and uh, I was ditching church one Sunday. And uh, I don't tell you everything about my past. That's it's one of my great sins right there. But uh, I, was, I was ditching church. I was just turned 16, had had my driver's license for just a little while. And I, I went out there, and James Carlisle, who's the bus director at the time, he had a, a one or two men. They were gassing up the buses. And, and I said, can I help you with that? He said, do you know how to drive one of these? Well, let me tell you, man, when you're 16, yeah. Yeah, I can drive one of those. So I pulled it out, put it over to the gas pump, filled it up with gas, took it back, barked, parked it in, backed it in the spot. And he said, man, you can drive one of them things, can't you? Well, I told you. Yeah, I can drive one. He said, how would you like to drive one every Sunday? Now, this was a different dispensation. That's when they let 16-year-olds drive. That's when we had no common sense whatsoever in America. And uh, I said, man, I would love that. And he said, he said uh, well, I'll tell you what. If you can get 15 people from your neighborhood to ride next Sunday, I'll let you drive one. He was pretty sharp. I didn't know anything about the bus ministry. I just knew, he said, 15 people. So you know what I did? I figured out everybody in our church who lived in my neighborhood. And the next week I went and I had 17. Now, they would have all probably ridden to church anyway in a car. But, but I got them on the bus and, and we had 17. And I, and I was a bus captain. Daryl Slaughter and I used to come down here on Saturday nights and get that bus. We take it. There was a gas station down, not a gas, a car wash down here on... Um, would it be my, what, what street would it be? Uh, some of you old East Durham people where, where the skating rink used to be. You know what I'm talking about? Miami Boulevard, and there was, a, there was a car wash right there. We would take that bus down there on Saturday nights. By the way, it beat going out drinking and drugging. And we'd come down here, he and I, we'd get that bus we'd take down there, and we would wash that thing. We would black the tires and armor all the seats. And, man, we didn't know nothing about the bus ministry, but we were looking good and uh, had a great time. You know what? I don't remember when it was, but at some point, at some point, I decided I was going to give up that bus route. And I remember going, and J.D. Serball was standing back here in this hall, and I remember stopping him with tears in my eyes, crying because I was quitting my bus route, and I was embarrassed. Hey, let me just, I'm not mad at anybody, but if you're a choir member and your choir is up here, what are you doing sitting out there? Amen. Uh, can I tell you, you ain't striving together. Oh, so he's mad tonight. You ain't even seen me mad. I'm just saying that, man, somewhere there ought to be something in us that says, you know what? I'm going to, hey, I'm going to exhibit an endurance that is unusual. 
I don't care if everybody around me lollygags and gives up and quits and throws in the towel. I'm going to stay and I'm going to be different than everyone else. If I do that, and you do that, you do that, you do that, and all you do that, you know what? We got a pretty good, hey, we have a pretty good thing going for a long time. But now we live in a culture where you got to beg people to come to church, you got to beg people to serve, you got to bribe people to be involved. You're always feeling like you got to handle people with kid gloves because everyone is so fragile. God help us. He said, I want you to stand strong. And endurance that is... What is it that you used to do for the Lord that you don't do anymore? And why? Because you're going to have to give an account one day. Striving together, it means an endurance that is unusual. Galatians 5.1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Philippians 4.1, Therefore, my beloved brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Why is it that those who've been married 50 years, those who've been pastored 30 years, those who have served in ministry 20 years, why is it that they are such an oddity? Can I tell you why? Because we have adopted a culture of quitting. Is anybody listening to me tonight? It would help me every once in a while if you at least nod your head. We have just, we have adopted, we have, we have become a culture of convenience. So when someone pastors a church for 30, I go places and preach now, you would think I was D.L. Moody. He's been pastoring three decades. There ought to be a line of men who've been pastoring three decades. Oh, these people just celebrated their 30th anniversary. Why doesn't everybody who gets married celebrate their 30th anniversary? An endurance that's unusual. I got to pick it up. I'm not, I'm not done with that one yet. Hang on. Moses is at the Red Sea, and the children of Israel came to the water's edge, and they looked back, and the Egyptian armies fast on their heels, and guess what they did? They started complaining. Well, we've been better off. We've been, back. we've been better off. You've never showed up. We've been better off. They start to murmur and complain in Exodus 14, 10. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. And behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, because there was no graves in Egypt, has thou taken us away to die? I, that their sarcasm kills me. Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? No, it's not. You were begging for somebody to come and deliver you from the misery that was your life. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. You know what happens? When the pressure is on, we begin to second guess ourselves. Well, this is tough. This is harder than I thought it was going to be. This ain't what I thought. This ain't what it's cracked up to be or whatever you want to say. Verse 13, Moses said unto the people, fear ye not, stand still. And see, now we, see, we think that means just don't do anything. No, it means to stand. He said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. I'd like to have been there. I'd like to have been there. They're standing there. The water parts. The Israelites start across on dry ground. They get to the other side. The Egyptian army comes, comes in behind them and the walls collapse and you don't see them no more. But guess what? Guess the only way you get to see that is if you stand. It's the only way you get to see it. If you, if you exhibit an endurance, that says, where, where are the believers who will stand? Where are the Christians who will persevere? Where are the saints who will set themselves apart by sticking it out when it would be much easier to throw in the towel? I read this week about a pastor who thought he had failed. And so 
He typed out a letter of resignation, stuffed and sealed all the envelopes, and took them to the post office, prayed over them, and dropped them in the, in the, in the mailbox at the post office to send his resignation letter to everyone in the church. The next day, the next day, he went to his mailbox, and all the letters, all the resignation letters were in his mailbox at the parsonage. And what he didn't know was that night, postage had increased three cents. And he didn't put enough postage on the stamps in order to get him out. He couldn't even succeed at quitting. <laughs> Why don't we just say, hey, let's strive together. Let's just endure. When it's good, when it's bad, when it's easy, when it's not, when it's, when it's, when it's encouraging, when it's discouraging, when people love it, when people hate it, let's just stand. Let's just endure. What does it mean to strive together? It means, thirdly, quickly, a courage that is undaunted. Look at verse 28. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which, to them is, which, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Let's be honest. We live in some pretty unsettling days, don't we? Wars and rumors of wars. Earthquakes. Floods hurricanes, natural disasters. I believe the Lord's coming back. But it might not be today. It might not be today. Praise God it wasn't yesterday. Some nutcase said it would be yesterday. I knew it wasn't going to happen yesterday. Because no man knows. We live in a day, hey, when terrorism is a very real threat. Terrorism, terrorism is not an ideology, ideology like communism or capitalism. Terrorism is a tactic, a strategy used to achieve a specific end. Listen to this. This strategy is often used in asymmetric, I guess is the right pronunciation, power struggles. When a weaker person or group is fighting against a powerful nation or state, the violence is aimed at creating fear in the targeted population and often provokes prompt and violent response from the state. Terrorism at its very core is meant to disrupt your life because of fear. That's what terrorism is. And it works. I told you the other day we were supposed to fly to we were supposed to fly to Atlanta uh, Monday, September 11th. When I booked the ticket, I got kind of uneasy. Why? Well, you know, September 11th. And I thought, what if some nutcase decides to celebrate the anniversary of 9-11? That's what, that's what terrorism does. That's what it was intended to do. We flew to Oregon the other day. You have to go, I hate flying. I absolutely detest flying. I don't, I've gotten to where I don't mind so much the flight itself, but just getting to the plane. I bought T TSA PreCheck. If you fly much, if you, if you don't have T, you ought to get it. It's, you, you go through the PreCheck line, and it, in some cases, it'll save you tons and tons and tons of time. But you, you get TSA PreCheck. It was like 90 bucks for three or four years or something like that. And, and you get to bypass the general population in this line, and you're not supposed to have to take your computer out of your bag, and you're not supposed to have to take your shoes off, and you're not supposed to have to take your coat off. And, and I'm going, man, I, I, and we were flying from uh, Oregon to Chicago, and the line was monstrous, the, the main line. And, and we, man, we had TSA. I was so glad. I got through, started through the metal detector. Beep. I've always wanted to just say, it's probably my pistol. I just always. <laughs> she said, it's your shoes. Take your shoes off. Those people are always so gracious too, by the way. So I had to take my shoes off, had to run them through the conveyor so they could check those to see what kind of bomb I had hidden in the heels. 
All of that. All that disruption. Why? Because of 9-11. Terrorism. But let me tell you, not all terrorism comes from ISIS, Iraq, or Afghanistan. Much of it comes from Satan. Satan is the master terrorist. You remember the definition that we gave? He is a weaker person, weaker than his nemesis. He is working to create fear, and his targeted population is the church. And we tonight, when we ought to be living with hope, we tend to live in fear. But my Bible tells me in 1st, 2nd Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. Oh, that tonight, as members of Fellowship Baptist Church, we would boldly stand for the Word of God, the cross of Christ, the doctrines of holiness and separation, the cause of the local church, and not succumb to the intimidation of our enemy who's trying to make us fearful. We ought to display a courage that is undaunted. Courage does not mean that you have no fear. Courage means you don't let fear stop you. That's what courage is. And then the last thing, and I, I hasten. If we're going to strive together, we, we've got to have a unity that is indivisible. <laughs> I'm so sick. I, I'm sick of, I, I, I hate professional sports. Our, our president said some things 48 hours ago he should not have said. And at the very least, he not, should not have said them the way that he said them. So, he attacked the NFL. And he used profanity, which is a sign of weakness. By the way, whether it's Donald Trump or the member of a Baptist church. It's a sign of weakness. And he said what needs to happen is when these guys don't stand during their national anthem. I, I'll be honest with you. I do agree with him in theory. I think in America, Americans ought to stand for the national anthem. Amen. Amen. There are other ways to protest. There are other ways to voice your displeasure with what is going on in our nation. It is pathetic. It is pathetic that spoiled, rotten, punk brats who make millions and millions and millions of dollars because they live in a free country that was provided them by people who gave their lives in defense of the flag. So Mike Tomlin says, the coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers, he says, uh, we are not going to participate in the anthem today because we want to be show solidarity. And I don't want some of our players to kneel and some of our players to stand. So we are not going to, we're not going to be on the field. I saw the report just a little bit ago. The reporter said, so let me make this clear, coach. You mean you're not going to be on the field for the anthem? He said, we are not going to be on the field for the national anthem. So they stayed in the locker room. They came out on the field, and all the fans in Chicago booed them. Worse than that, the Bears beat them. And the Bears are terrible. They got to be terrible. They got a quarterback from NC State. Booyah! Got you, Chuck. <laughs> Todd and Jamie, I see you. I'm watching you. They're no good. They, I, think they, I don't think they won a game, and they went out there and beat the Steelers. Oh, by the way. They did not show solidarity because they had one guy who played for their team named Villanueva who defied his coach's orders, came to the end of the tunnel, and when the national anthem was played in full uniform, put his hand on his heart. You know why? Because he went to Afghanistan and fought for his country. Sad. Sad world we're living in. Sad country we're living in. I'm going to tell you what's worse. It's sad when that kind of mindset spills over into the church. we got to strive together. There needs to be a unity that is indivisible. 
with each other in conjunction, jointly, in cooperation, in collaboration, in partnership, in combination, in league, in tandem, side by side, hand in hand, and shoulder to shoulder. We need to understand the power tonight of a church like ours. I'm not giving you, I'm joking with you about the song, by the way. The song is fine. But, but God, God did not intend for his church to hold the fort. The Bible said, upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Do you know that gates are defensive? You know what that means? That means the church should be offensive. Nobody's ever been beaten to death with a gate. Gates keep people, they, they protect. So here's what, here's what Jesus said. <clears throat> Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. That doesn't mean that we sit here and cower down and hold the fort and hope that Jesus comes. It means that we strive together, that we infiltrate the culture, that we try to make a difference in this world instead of sitting around complaining about how bad it is. That's what that means. But our strength is when we're united. That's where we find our strength, is, is when we are one, when we are striving together. Sermon illustration, I don't know that it's true. I read it. I don't have it in my outline, but I just thought about it. Many years ago, there was a little girl that was lost. She wandered off in the woods. And they called together search teams, and, and they would go out. They would call and call and call and, and search and they did that for two days. Finally, somebody said, hey, I got an idea. Now this has become one of the common strategies for search and rescue. But they said, let's do this. Let's all, let's all get together and let's, let's just let's hold hands and let's comb this, this piece of woods together. And they did that. And about 15 minutes into their search, they found her little body. And someone said, oh, that we had come together two days ago. I don't ever want that to be said about our church. Little things, little, little silly, petty, insignificant minutia. We... we we let Satan get his foot in the door and, and it, it causes division. I'm not trying to fix a problem. I'm trying to prevent a problem. Amen. By the way, the word strive there, it means to fight. You know what we're fighting against? We're fighting against sin. We're, we're fighting for unity among, amongst ourselves and we're fighting for the faith. And, 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 and God said, that's how I want you to live. I don't, I don't know what that something is that's causing you not to be in harmony with other believers, but I can tell you this, it's not worth it. What if in a church the pastor and the people strove together? What if parents and teachers strove together? What if the law, local law enforcement and the citizens strove together? together. We live in a society whose very fabric is being ripped apart when our greatest chances for success are found in striving together. I read a, I read a story about Jimmy Durante, one of the great entertainers of a generation ago, and he was asked to be a part of, more than a generation, but he was asked to be a part of a show for World War II vets, and, and he told them his schedule was very busy, but he said, I, I, I can give you just a few minutes I could only do one short monologue. That would be all I would have time to do. I have other appointments and would need to leave right away. Of course, the show's director agreed happily, but when Jimmy got on stage, something interesting happened. He went through the short mon monologue, but he didn't leave. He stayed. And now he's been on stage for 15 minutes, 20, 30 minutes, and finally he took a, a last bow and left the stage to thunderous applause he got backstage and someone stopped him and said, I, th I thought you had to go after a few minutes. What happened? Jimmy Durante answered, I did have to go. But if you'll come over here, I'll show you why I stayed. 
You can see for yourself if you look down the front row. In the front row were two men, each of whom had lost an arm in the war. One had lost his right arm and the other had lost his left. And together they sat on the front row and were able to clap. And Jimmy Durante said, how could I walk out on people like that? Striving together. May God help us this fall. Father, I pray you would help us tonight. Use these thoughts. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for those who have modeled endurance for us. God, thank you for those who are living a life that is worthy of the God. Not that we'll ever, we'll ever deserve salvation, but a life that is becoming of the gospel. Would you help us tonight speak to our hearts? Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm going to ask you to stand. I went just a few minutes longer than I thought I would. Tonight, <clears throat> I'm not going to ask you for any kind of show of hands. If the Lord's spoken to your heart, you know it. Say, Man, I've been discouraged, preacher. I've been about ready to throw in the towel. Hey, <laughs> ain't nobody got time for that. Man, we need to live for God. We, we, need to, we, need to, we need to put him first in our lives. Father, I pray you would bless the preaching of your word, and I pray you would help us all to strive together. It's what the world needs. May we not succumb to the terrorism that Satan has inflicted upon us. May we have courage that is undaunted. Bless this invitation. She'll play if God has spoken to your heart tonight and there's something you need to pray about. I invite you to come. Oh, that God would help us to always be a church that strives together. You just do business with the Lord. It's between you and the Lord. If you need someone to pray with you tonight, if you need someone to talk with you, if you'll see one of these men, someone will be glad to do that. If you've never been saved, you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, why don't you come tonight? See one of these men. We had three or four people this morning who responded to the invitation for salvation. What a wonderful thing that is. May God help us all to determine that we're going to strive together for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sometimes Satan uses terrorism. He gives you a fear that you'll fail. He tells you you can't do it. You'll never be able to. You'll never be good enough. He's such a deceiver. and such a liar. It's all terrorism. It's all terrorism. He is the master terrorist. He intimidates us. We fail to witness. We fail to invite people to church. We fail to pray over our food in public places. We're afraid to be different from anyone because we don't want to be ostracized. It's all terrorism. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Please don't misunderstand anything I've said tonight. I don't mean that we're ever going to live a life that, that, that is deserving. But I'll tell you what we can do. We can make Jesus look good. We can do that. We, we can 
You know why sometimes it doesn't look good on us? We say, well, it's just not me. We had a kid recently say, well, this just isn't, this just isn't for me. Well, let me tell you what, he died for you. He died for you. You, you can be seated. Thank you for your patience. In just a moment, we'll have our video, our announcements. Pray for uh, Zeke Dennis. He has a, a big test on Tuesday. They're going to try to stimulate a seizure. And my phone just cycled out. Uh, so that they can figure out what their next step of treatment is. And so I know many of you are praying for uh, Zeke, and I hope you'll remember that on Tuesday at 1030. We'll have our video. Don't forget uh, the, the Paris's. It's not a big sit-down, stay, uh, but just if you have time to pass through the Fellowship Hall and wish Emma a happy 18th birthday, that's what they're looking for, right, Mike? And uh, so there's cupcakes back there. You help yourself to, to one of those. And uh, we'll have our video and then our, our chorus and we'll be dismissed. Thank you for joining us today. Be sure to mark your calendars for some special events happening here at Fellowship. The FBA soccer team will be hosting their second annual cornhole tournament this Saturday at 1.30. The cost is $25 per team and the winning team will receive a $250 cash prize. All proceeds... That was yesterday. By the way, who won the cornhole tournament? Chris and Grant won the cornhole tournament yesterday. Congratulations, those guys. Are, thank you. You can clap for them. Are we living in the right week now, guys? All right, good. That's a horrible picture. for joining with us today. That's much better. Be sure to mark your calendars for some very special events happening here at Fellowship. Our fall program begins next Sunday. This will be a special day for our senior saints. We will start the morning with a continental breakfast for everyone ages 60 and older. Also, we will take some time in our morning service to honor some longtime servants here at Fellowship. We encourage you to grab some invitations and invite your senior friends to next week's Honor Sunday. Two weeks from today will be our Millennial Day. There will be a special message and encouraging music in the morning service. Following the morning service, there will be a meal for everyone ages 19 through 35 and their families. There are plenty of invitations for the church family to take with them and pass out during the next two weeks for our Millennial Sunday. Every Wednesday, our church family gathers together for our midweek Bible study. There is a dinner at 6.15, followed by the service at 7. Kids are invited to be a part of the Patch the Pirate Clubs, and teens are encouraged to join the other teens for their own midweek study and a helpful devotion to encourage their faith. We would love for you to join us. Our Ladies Conference is just two weeks away. On October 6th and 7th, our church will host a regional conference for ladies and girls ages third grade and up. Ladies are encouraged to bring a dessert for the conference dinner on Friday night. Sign up sheets and brochures with more information about this conference are available in the foyer. Ladies, you will not want to miss this year's Ladies Conference. That is all for today. Visitors, be sure to turn in your connection card and receive your gift bag from the hospitality desk in the foyer. Pastor Finley will be available in the auditorium if you would like to speak with him. If you have any questions about any of the announcements, please see one of our church staff members. Have a great week and we will see you this Wednesday. All right, let's all stand together. There is a name that I love to hear and it's Jesus, amen. Let's sing it together. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. And oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. Have a wonderful week. You are dismissed.